So anyway, I had uh, I had surgery. I eventually had surgery. I had prostate cancer, basically. Had surgery, and um, uh, I've been six years all clear. So that's um, that's been uh, great news and good news, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, but I am also deeply aware that there are people whose journey and story is very different than that, and it's a longer story of pain and struggle. I ended up, I, just one little bit of it was my, my operation was postponed six times. Um, once I'd already had all the pre-meds and everything like that. Had this rather weird moment of going around a supermarket after us because uh, I had to go, they just had to send me home because uh, the surgery before me took nine hours. And um, so they said, well, you go home, we'll have to rearrange it. And I was high on pre-meds, wandering around a supermarket. <laughs> and Pixie was, um, doing some shopping, she found me by the whiskey department looking like Johnny Depp. <laughs> so, that's really kind of a weird moment. Um, but yeah, so if your journey has been more painful and more difficult, as it often is, and you may be still going, going through with it, Jesus understands that. And he has not left you one minute, one second, one, one fraction of a second, he is with you alongside. Uh, John Marks Templeton, who is a famous philanthropist, was once asked, what do you consider to be the single most important factor to your success? Now he was he, he set up an award that actually um, scientists often use in the interaction between faith and science. This is called the Templeton Award and some friends of mine have you know, um, benefited and been blessed by that. But this is what he said, um, or was reputed to have said, probably he said, my concept of reality has been the single most important factor to my success, my concept of reality. Over the years, I've been convinced of a higher power that nothing exists except God. There is no other reality. What people in the past called reality is temporary and often misleading. For example, take the concept that you are sitting still. The truth is, because the Earth is rotating, you're going eastward at more than 1,000 miles an hour. Because the Earth is revolving around the Sun, you're going in another direction at 2,000 miles an hour. And because we think the Sun is rotating in a Milky Way galaxy, you're flying at 15,000 miles an hour. All these directions are realities. Therefore, the appearance that you're sitting still is very misleading. <laughs> And I think that's one of the things that I've tried to say about one-to-ones um, -one with Jesus and when I was talking about Nicodemus, because I don't want you to think that actually you put your brain on the shelf when you become a Christian and you follow God. What you're doing is you're acknowledging that your perception of reality is not the real perception of reality, if you like. It's not, that's not the full picture. And that actually coming to Jesus realigns you have to do a paradigm shift to see things in a new and fresh way and sometimes you think and, and maybe you've you've had that experience you think there's something about here and then you discover actually it's over here or you think that well, somebody saying that meant this and actually what they meant was this you ever had that and you make this paradigm shift and say oh my goodness i was upset because they said that but actually it wasn't that at all that's a simple way of doing it, but sometimes the way we understand a situation or a piece of news or whatever, and it's distorted, that's why this whole thing about fake news and all that kind of thing, because even when you get, whatever you get on the internet, don't necessarily believe it. You know, you're, the perception of reality is what you're just being given. So trying to, to work that out, and coming to Jesus gives you the perception of reality. Jesus is the reality point, as it were. That's, that's where it all happens. He is the real. Uh, as a new, new, one of the things I was thinking about when I was going on retreat was, is there a book? Because Caleb said, would you do one-to-ones? Uh, talk about one-to-ones. And I said, yeah, that'd be great. I'll need to revisit John's Gospel. So I went online to see when I was driving from Wellington to Wanganui earlier this week. I thought, I'll see if I can get an audio book. I wonder if Tom Wright's done something on John's Gospel, for example. And uh, anyway, I found this book, and uh, it's called Broken Signposts, uh, an audio book. And I thought, oh, I haven't seen that one before. I'll see if I've got it in my Bible package that I have, because I have loads of books stuffed on my Bible package. So I don't just have a pile of books. I have a whole thousands of books on my iPad as well. And I discovered that I hadn't got it. So I thought, how did I not know 
that Tom Wright had written a book on John's Gospel on broken signposts. Until I went to, to look at when it was published, it was published the 6th of October 2020. <laughs> <laughs> so this was like, oh right, okay, this is timely. <laughs> Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a really interesting book that I've been listening through. It actually has nothing to do with one-to-ones, but it actually is on John's Gospel. And one of the things that he, Tom Wright's doing is, if you've read his Simply Christian, which is a really good, helpful book to, for people exploring the Christian faith, it's an extension to that, but it's from John's Gospel. And he basically is saying there are various themes that he has identified that people relate to, that actually are signposts to the existence of God, and the transformative power of Jesus. And he highlights those through John's Gospel in his book, Broken Signposts. And they're these, justice, love, spirituality, beauty, freedom, truth, and power. Those, he says, are the signposts that give those pointers. And he, he makes point, but he says, those signposts are broken. That is the problem, we're in a fallen world and they're broken. And not only, and, and this is my addition to that, I'm sure Tom Wright will probably say something similar to this anyway, I've not got through the rest of this book. Like our concept of justice, for example, the concept of justice in the world is broken, but actually our view of justice is distorted. So we think justice should be like this, and actually we sometimes take exception when we read something in the Bible and say, no, that's not right, this is what it should be like. You know, Paul, Paul must have got it wrong on this, that, or the other. You know, so we, we, we immediately, what we do is we downgrade the author of a book of the Bible because we think, well, he's biased or prejudiced or he's misogynistic or we'll, we'll throw all kinds of stuff that we'll put in about that and we'll say, yeah, but what I'm saying is this. Our perception, so we think our perception of reality is better than Paul. Or we think our perception of reality is better than Jesus. Uh, I, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't have to try and make sense of what Paul is saying in a particular way or what Jesus is saying. Is but we are generally our automatic default position is our gut feeling is this is what it should look like, and therefore that can't be right. Whereas what Jesus is saying to Nicodemus is this: Nicodemus, you need a whole radical rethink because your gut feeling. Your perception of reality is one like John Mark Templeton, is you're saying, actually, you think you know more than Jesus. And let's remember, Jesus is, if you have a one-to-one -one with Jesus, you're having a one-to-one -one with God. So I don't really want to get there at the end and say, uh, God, let me take a couple of issues with you over your perception of justice or your perception of beauty or what, you know, I'm not going to be, my heart is going to, when I face God in that way, it's going to be like a Paul Newman moment. My ice cream will be in my hammock. You know what I mean? It will be. That's a, that's, so it's, it's realigning and all those different things, there's a challenge. And Tom, Tom Wright uses very mundane things sometimes. So it's like trying to work out uh, how to put a wardrobe together if you buy it somewhere. It's in Missouri, and you're looking at these instructions, and these instructions have probably been translated six times through different versions, and you look at them and you think, really? <laughs> and there's a picture here of this wardrobe. I've got these instructions, but boy, I can't make sense of these instructions. And half the time it's because we are coming with our own expectations of what things should look like. So maybe we need to make that paradigm shift. We need to make that change. And uh, we do it. So this is what I think. This is what Jesus thinks. You know, there's, a, there's a, the challenge for us. So broken signposts. Our signposts are broken. So we're all coming broken. And actually, pretty much, if you look at what's in John's Gospel, it's brokenness. The second half of John's Gospel is about brokenness in every single way. And that's where we're going to go with these one-to-ones. It's about brokenness. Time and time again, there's brokenness. There is, for example, in, in John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. We'll think about that in a moment. There is, for example, in John chapter 11, there's Mary of Bethany and Martha in their grief and sorrow for their dear brother who has died. 
and their mixed emotions. Jesus, if you had been here, it would have been different. And then there's the complete, you know, shock and horror, transformation in that moment when uh, Lazarus comes out. I was watching uh, um, some, some, some people familiar with the Touch of Frost. Remember David Jason's uh, um, a Touch of Frost was really interesting. Just that we were watching one recently, and then it was about a child who had died, and a child had gone missing, and the parents were being brought to the mortuary to identify the child. So they'd been told their child had died. They came to identify the child. Uh, so they, you know, they're gutted, they're devastated, they're broken, everything. And then they come to identify the child. It's not their child. And there is the whole emotional thing swing. Suddenly, actually, it's not their child, but the child is still missing. Of course. And here, like for for Mary and Martha, it's like this is their 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 brother is dead. And now the brother is not dead. That's that emotional, there's, there's turmoil there. And then we see more with Mary of Bethany. And sometimes Augustine connects Mary of Bethany with Mary Magdalene. And uh, so uh, sometimes you can see this whole mix of emotions with Mary of Bethany and Mary Magdalene later on, who will not even be consoled by angels because the person she loved is no longer. So we'll, there's brokenness even there. And then there's brokenness on the cross. And isn't it, there's something uniquely powerful here in this moment of brokenness. Um, our own brokenness and seeing the brokenness of God. So uh, one time at Lee Abbey, where I was leading, I was, we had what we called a divorce recovery weekend. There was people whose lives had been broken, their marriages were broken, they were struggling, and they were still carrying wounds and hurts. And this was a, a process, a weekend, where they could just talk with others and be prayed through and ministered. And some people were, wouldn't have professed to be Christians in that context, but they were coming because they needed some recovery, recovery process. And then at the end of this, there's a communion service. So people who were there would be allowed would be invited to come and participate in a communion service if they wanted to but if they weren't believers and they didn't want to it was okay so it was a free option and a friend of mine was talking with somebody who wasn't a professed christian but she but she basically said i'm not coming to the communion service and, you know god allowed my relationship my marriage to fall apart like this and i'm still angry and she said that's okay and then eventually she decided she would just come but not participate so she got to the um she got and we had this service and just before we came to, um, to I came to preside and uh, to, to bless the bread and the wine, just in the hymn before, the Holy Spirit said something to me and uh, that's when you're trying to do a complete rethink. You've got one verse left and then you're supposed to be getting up and doing something and I'm thinking, I haven't got much time here. What are you trying to say, Holy Spirit, kind of thing. And then afterwards, I got up and I stood at the, the table and I, I was talking about the loss of lament. How in our society we've forgotten how to lament, to really lament and grieve over stuff. And how, you know, one third of the Psalms are lament Psalms. The Psalmist knew how to lament, to express, to get the stuff out, the brokenness out. And I was saying, one, and, and how in worship songs, there are very few lament worship songs, you know. Lots of praise worship songs, but very few lament worship songs. Much more difficult to express. It. But one real blessing is that on the table, at the centre of our worship, is brokenness. Here is somebody who was rejected. Here is somebody who was exchanged for another. Here is somebody who was falsely accused. All here on the table. And there's this woman here who's not wanting to participate, who's listening to this. Here is somebody who was forgotten. She took communion because she realized that God had been there. That's the great thing about John's Gospel, is that he's there in all the brokenness, all of it. And he's not forgotten you. I had a phone call. Um, uh, a 
couple of years back from a former warden of mine in a parish that I'd worked in. Her name was Cindy. Uh, lovely, lovely person. We'd worked together. We actually worked together doing some drama and various things. And, uh, uh, and so we formed quite a good friendship. And her husband, Chris, wouldn't have professed to be a believer. But actually, with a lot of things that we were doing, he would be on the outskirts, on the edge. He would come and help with practical things and so on. Um, he was a really nice guy. We had a good relationship, despite the fact that he was an Arsenal supporter and I was a Spurs supporter. We had a the Tottenham supporter. We had a good. We still had a good relationship. But then I left. I moved on uh, to other stuff, another parish, and so on. Anyway, Cindy phoned me up. She said, "David, just want you to know, Chris collapsed this week." He had a tumour on his brain. He's got a tumour on his brain. And um, his speech is going and his prognosis is not good. And uh, so he's now in hospital. And I, I, I could tell she was really gutted and wrestling with that. And uh, I said, I'm sorry to hear that. And I was four hours away from where, um, where they were. But as soon as I put the phone down, I knew I had to go. So I said to Pixie, I, I need to go, I need to go see Chris in the hospital. And Pixie said, well, what are you going to say when you see Chris? And I said, I have absolutely no idea what I'm going to say when I see Chris. But there was a song from the, um, the Christian band Casting Crowns. You know, don't know the answer to all of life's questions, just show that you love them, show that you care. Love them like Jesus, was the refrain in the song. And I said, I'm just going to go love them like Jesus. So I, was getting, I got in the car and I was driving, uh, for this four hour drive along the motorway, and I'm praying with my eyes open. <laughs> and uh, asking God, you know, uh, for uh, how can I be present with Chris in this situation? And then Jesus spoke to me in the car. Again, it was one of those moments. I don't get like writing, you know, it's not a plane that flies across with some text or, or anything like that. It's just a deep impression. I felt the Holy Spirit say, there is something I want you to say to, to Chris when you get there. Just four words, David. So I, I'm, okay, four, four words, four words. So I hold on to that. Anyway, I get to the hospital, I get out, and I know the situation with Chris. As I said, when, Chris, when I knew Chris, he would be on the edge of things. But I think the ministry that followed me was a bit more black and white. And so Chris had not felt he could access, so he distanced himself from the church pretty much all together. So he, and he felt judged and condemned. Anyway, I walked into the hospital, into the room, he was in a room on his own, I opened the door, and oh, just before that, I phoned Cindy, and she said, David, you need to bury him, he might not recognize you, and also, he might be very frustrated because he's not communicating very well, his speech is gone. So I said, okay. So I go in through the door, immediately he recognizes me, uh, he, he, light, he lights up, and I, I light up, I go over and I say hi, and uh, immediately we go to Arsenal Tottenham and have this exchange of football. Um, I think we'd recently beaten Arsenal in a football game, so it's quite, it's quite, it's quite a bit of fun. Uh, so there's a bit of banter, and then uh, I got out my iPad, and one of our kids had just recently got married. So I, I sort of took him through just some pictures on my iPad, which he responded to and pointed to people that he recognized and knew, which was really was great. And then I just stopped, I said, Chris, I don't know how to tell you this, but I was driving here on the way and Jesus spoke to me about you. And um, he wanted me to say something to you. And he sort of looked at me a bit, his eyes got big for a second. He looked at me and I said, are you, are you comfortable with me just sharing that? And he sort of nodded. So I, I said, well, Jesus says to you, Chris, let us be friends. Let us be friends. And he just started weeping. And I started weeping. And I said, Chris, do you want to know the friendship of Jesus? Would you like me to pray that you know the friendship of Jesus? And he took my hand, my arm, and squeezed it. And I, and I took that as a yes. So we prayed that he would know the friendship of Jesus. And as I was praying, his, his fingernails were squeezing deep into my wrist. I just prayed that he would know the friendship of Jesus from this moment onwards. 
And then we pulled up out of that moment of prayer and we went back to football. You know, it just needed to lighten and we talked football and then I left shortly afterwards. I said, great to know you. And I got in the car, drove the four hours home, got home, Cindy phoned me and she said, um, thank you for going. She said, I don't know what happened, David. I don't know what happened when you went in there. But she said, I've been in to see Chris. And as soon as I walked in to see Chris, Chris said this, and I don't say this boastfully, just so you know the, the, the moment. Chris, all he could say was, David, David, brilliant, brilliant. And she said every day after that, she was able to pray with Chris until the day that he died. And at the funeral, I was able to give testimony to Chris, knowing the friendship of Jesus. Jesus doesn't miss you. He doesn't miss your hurt. And he doesn't miss your brokenness. He knows it. He knows our heart better than anybody else. I read a beautiful thing this, um, this week from George MacDonald. George MacDonald was a mentor for C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis said, I know no one who seems to be more like Jesus than George MacDonald, a writer, and he, he really read his stuff, and he wrote an anthology. And I was reading one of those things, uh, and it's from Revelation 2.17, I think it's 2.17, where um, the one who conquers is given a white stone with a name on it. Right? And George MacDonald says, that uh, in, in that moment, the giving of the white stone, you are given a white stone, and on that white stone is your name. But not the name you carry now, the name that God always has for you. And you will not be given that name till the end. But only God gives you that name. So it's you as an individual that God is interested in, but it is particularly you that God is interested in. Your journey, your ups, your downs, your pains, your sorrows, your joys, your life, he knows your name and he will give you your name and when you're given that name, you will know it is your name. That's the journey God has with you. And that's the one-to-one -one he wants with you. That was, I thought that was a rather special moment from George MacDonald. God knows. The woman who is caught in adultery. You may remember it's early morning, Jesus is in the temple teaching and there's some people there. And he's actually writing, illustrating from the sand. And these religious leaders, so there's this contrast between the, the, those who believe and receive and those who don't believe and don't receive. You see it, so like for example, the official believes and receives. And when the man is healed by the pool, the religious leaders don't believe and don't receive. You, you, you see that moment? And then you get, uh, you get Lazarus is raised from the dead, and people believe and receive, but then there, is, there are those who don't believe and don't receive. And so when we come to this story, we've got a woman who's been caught in the act of adultery. Where is the man? Where is the man in that moment? This is all for effect. You know, let's get the woman, emotional impact. Bring her, this woman's caught in the act of adultery. The law says she should be stoned. Jesus, what were you saying? Total effect, it's a manipulation of the scene. They will not receive and they will not believe. The religious leaders have already decided. So they bring him to Jesus, they bring her to Jesus. And I'm always amazed by this story. Uh, partly, there's a, there's a painting, I can't remember the artist, I wish I brought it, there's a painting that's got this woman in all of her vulnerability, who's standing there, and all these men, and there is Jesus, who is looking with compassion, and there are men everywhere, all around, and there are fingers pointed all over. Coming, you just you, you see these hands and the hatred in the eyes. It's like there's no concern for the personal in this moment. It's all a principle. It's the principle of the thing. 
That is personal. It's always personal. So the woman is there in all her vulnerability and they're waiting to see what Jesus says. And there's an incredible patience about Jesus. I, I wish I had the patience. You know, most situations, I think, uh, after a situation, I think, I wish I'd said that. Or I wish I'd thought that. Well, I wish I just paused and wrote in the sand for a while before I said anything. Because in that moment, as Jesus, there's, the, there's just that pause, that reflection. Then he gets up and says, he who has never sinned past the first day. So you see the patience of Jesus. Then you see one by one, they all disappear. No one throws the stone. But there's still one person standing there with the woman. It is Jesus. So you see the innocence of Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one in the space who is able to cast the stone. But he chooses not to. So you see the forgiveness of Jesus. And then he says to her, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Has there been anything in the past that still comes back to you? That nudges away at night? Or when you're alone and on your own and you think, I wish I'd never done that. I wish I'd never said that. I wish I'd never behaved in that way. I wish I'd not done that. I wish if, if, if only, if only, if only, Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go. Leave it. Leave it there. The heavenly dustman has cleared the rubbish. Don't go back into the rubbish bin and haul it out again. It's gone. And then there is the grief. There is the story of Mary and Martha and their brokenness. And the amazing healing of raising from the dead Lazarus. And of course we see this a very interesting story straight afterwards where um, Mary Magdalene and I am going to connect the two just for a moment. Mary Magdalene comes and bathes, wipes Jesus' feet with ointment with her hair and um, you'll see this in a number of the different gospel accounts and slightly different people are indignant if Jesus knew what she was like, why would, you know, why would he let her do that? Or Judas, who just raises, you know, couldn't she have used all that ointment to, to save the money and give it to the poor? It's like, okay, let's bring a principal in here. You know, think, think about the poor at this moment. You're not thinking about the poor at this moment. You're just angry. Just acknowledge what it is. You're angry. Uh, or you're disgusted, or whatever. You're not thinking about the poor, you're not thinking about, you know, right living. You're just angry. Get it out, get the anger out. Because if the anger stays there, the person it damages is you. This week was an interesting journey for me when I was on retreat because um, I say to Sarah and Kevin, they said, what are you hoping for in this week when you're spending some time here and praying? Uh, you know, because when you go on retreat, sometimes you think about the future. So what do you want me to do next, Lord? Or you're thinking about um, you know, the current situation you're in, like the cathedral and its ministry and so on. Well, I, I didn't think about the cathedral at all, actually. Uh, and I didn't think about the future at all. In fact, I said to Sarah and Kevin, actually, it feels like going on retreat is I'm just being reunited with an old friend. I just need to be reconnected with my old friend. And he's not old, of course, because you can't define God by being old or young. It's just there, present. But 
Whenever you, maintain, you, you want a, a union to get one, to get back with God, there's always stuff there that surfaces. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not plain, plain sense, it's not just straight, it's to sit down, about to pray. And uh, I read something from John of the Cross to start off with, and it's about baggage. Now, so, David, why do you behave in that particular way? Or can't we just get on with, you know, having a nice praise time with Jesus? Do you have to always raise something? Well, there's a couple of things, you know, those behaviours that you do there, they're actually really to do with, aren't they, David, about that back there. You know, your, your breathing or your moving. So, for example, one thing that I've come to terms with this week or have been over time, but this come back surface this week, is that when I was a kid, we moved a lot. And actually, when you move a lot, you become more protective about yourself and your vulnerabilities. You don't want to um, be too open to people because you might have to say goodbye to them. So all relationships are kept at a superficial level. David, says the Holy Spirit, says Jesus in the one-to-one. Is there time to talk about that? Can we talk about something else? Isn't it time to talk about that and bring that to me? and let go of that. I still, even now I can feel myself getting emotional. I still have, when I was 10 years old and I left, I left London where I was living to move to Bristol, my best friend, who was a Pakistani boy, called Rafi Ahmed, never forgotten his name, walked me to the school gate and said goodbye, and I had to walk home. Still, I feel the wound of that. I was 10. That's so many years ago, 50 plus years ago. So that's kind of, you know, it still comes. So there's that, okay, okay, God, okay, I bring that. And then, you know, okay, so David, this other behavior here, we dealt with that one, this isn't one enough in a retreat, God, you know. Then there's this one, you know, that relationship. What then? Why is that still, you know, that's still bothering you, isn't it? Because you do this, or this, or this. And then I have to address that one. And it's not like you're, you're sorting it. You just have to acknowledge it. It comes, it's brought to the surface, and you bring it and let go of it with Jesus. And say, okay, I'm going to let go of this. And probably there'll be times when I'll have to go back to that again and let go of it again, because it comes back, but it's important in this one-to-one -one here. And then there's, there's the other stuff. There's, as I mentioned, the grieving. Both my parents died when I was in New Zealand. So the first time was in two, my dad died in 2016, when Caleb and Billy were priested and Phoebe was baptized. And um, my mum had dementia for um, quite a few years and it got, it got, my dad was her primary carer and it got to the point where um, he couldn't cope anymore. But in a way, I didn't see that as soon as I should have seen. So immediately you can see some connection where I begin to feel guilty about, I wish I had seen this earlier. And then he got, to, he got to a point where he couldn't cope anymore. We had to take him to the hospital. He discovered he had cancer of the esophagus. And uh, he, was, he gave up, basically. And uh, he was in hospital. And then we had to make a decision about whether we come to New Zealand and be part of the journey of our son and granddaughter and so on, or whether we'd stay there. And we knew that it was right and important to come. So we, so we came. And um, I had a rather special moment because we were, we actually, we're going back there this week, which is, is part of the journey of dealing with grief as well. We're going back to the foot of Mount Taranaki, where we stayed in a hotel um, uh, place. Uh, and uh, um, we were all sharing the same room. I remember Kayla and Billy and Phoebe and Pixie and I, just to save some money. And at two o'clock in the morning, 
my phone goes and I grab the phone, I know what it's going to be, so I jump out into the car park and I'm standing in the car park in, this, in the cold, it was really cold, listening to my brother say, Dad has died. And so you have this moment of, in a way it's a practical moment because you're just trying to, to come to terms with what's happened. And then I say, um, thank you, and we hang up, and I put the phone in my pocket. And then I think to myself, why is it so light? It's two o'clock in the morning. And I look up, and the Milky Way is in full display above me. And the moon is out, and it's shining on the mountain, which is covered in snow. And God says, just drink. Drink of this for a moment. David, you need to know that this stretches all the way around to the other side of the world. And I am with you here as I'm with your dad in England and with your brother. Be blessed. Know that I love you. All. And this week, it's like God saying to me again, David, do you think your dad would want you to feel bad when you're enjoying something? He would want you to feel joy when you're enjoying something. And you can share that joy and not feel guilty that he's no longer present with you when you're enjoying something. Release. Let me in to heal brokenness. And that's what we need to do. We need to let Jesus heal the brokenness. So we're going to have some prayer ministry in a moment. And let Christ deal with it. One final one to one before we do that. And that is one that is not in John's Gospel. But I can't... Well, it is in John's Gospel, but it's not recorded in a sense because it is when Jesus is led to be crucified. Uh, he make, he's brought up, Simon of Cyrene carries the cross, drops it down, Jesus is laid out on the cross. And probably this size nail is used to put one in his wrist here, one in his wrist, one in his feet. And he's hanging there and the cross is lifted up with a winch and pulley right up and then dropped into a socket and he's hanging there and two thieves begin to mock as the religious leaders do saying call yourself the son of God get yourself down off the cross now and he says father forgive them for they don't know what they're doing and one thief begins to think twice and he thinks, who is this man in the middle? How can he forgive? I'm here for my crimes, for all that I've done. I deserve to be on the cross. But there's something about this guy in the middle. This undying love that oozes from him. So he musters up his energy, all that he has left on the cross with the nails in his hands and feet, and he says, Jesus, will you remember me when you get in your kingdom? And Jesus turns and looks at him and says, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And from that moment onwards, this guy is free. Nailed to the cross, but free. Dying, but living for the first time. He's had a one-to-one -one with Jesus. And we say, hey, he was never confirmed. He never lived a good life. He never went to church. We never did any of those things. What gives him the right? We come back to the woman at the well. 
if you know the gift of God and who it is that's speaking to you, you would ask. And he would give you such as you would never thirst again. All he has to do is ask. That's why prayer ministry is so important. Because in prayer ministry, what you're doing is asking. Just pray and ask. And have that one to one. And let Jesus deal with what is there under the surface, unacknowledged, unaddressed, and bring healing. All you have to do is ask. So Caleb, you're going to come and just lead us for a moment. I'm going to pray and then he'll lead us in this. Perhaps if we, if we can stand, let's stand. If you'd rather sit, it's okay too. Remember, your story is unique to you, nobody else. So God knows, nobody else necessarily knows. You need to ask. The stuff that he's raising to the surface, let him. I'm just going to say a prayer and then let Caleb lead us. Again, Jesus is in front. He knows the name on the white stone for you. He knows you better than you know yourself. Lord Jesus, thank you that you're here, inviting us into a one-to-one, -one. and gently bringing to us our brokenness to be healed. We open our heart to you.